Welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you guys are here. Whether you're joining us in person or maybe you're joining us online, uh, our hope and prayer is that this will become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. Uh, I want to let you know about something that's happening next week. Can you believe it? It's Easter already. Uh, that is crazy. Uh, so we have two things happening. One is on Saturday, we have our special egg hunt, which is designed for uh, all kids. We'll have the hunts for uh, every kid um, and age group and all that. But we, we created this event for kids with special needs. Uh, so we'll have three different hunts that are designed for uh, kids who have visual impairments, so beeping eggs that they'll be finding, uh, kids who have mobility challenges. Uh, we use like dowel rods and magnets and all that stuff to be able to help them do that. Uh, and then uh, silent hunts for kids that have ASD or uh, other sensory challenges. It's one of my favorite things that we do as a church. We've had over 1,900 people register already. Uh, so if, you, uh, if, you, if you've got kids and you haven't registered, you need to. Um, and uh, if you want to come and be a part and to serve in any capacity, we'd love to have you a part of that as well. And then the very next day is Easter. Uh, so we have these little invite cards on your seats. I want to encourage you. We, we've asked you to be praying for somebody in your life to invite um, uh, we, we encourage you guys to write those names down and you could submit those through a survey that we did. <clears throat> and I've been praying through every one of those names, uh, every person by name and for you by name as well, that God would give you an opportunity to invite them. People are more open to an invitation to church right now than any other time throughout the year. So your invitation could lead to transformation in somebody else's life. So I just want to encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of that and, um, and to allow God to use you in somebody else's life. Uh, today we are uh, going to be finishing up our Taboo series. Uh, I will say, man, uh, you guys have I've shown up. Uh, you've allowed God to speak into your life. I've heard so many uh, incredible stories and testimonies from uh, the last few weeks and what God's been doing in your life. Uh, today uh, we're hitting a, a, probably a topic I would say that hits all of us um, um, and is one of the most challenging ones. We've already hit some, some uh, really deep topics like depression and anxieties and negativity and um, uh, anger, burnout. Uh, today we're going to be uh, looking at addiction. And let me give you a, a simple definition for addiction. It's a mental dependence on something. So when you have a mental dependence on something, that results in uh, addiction. Now, before we jump in, I wanted to pray for us. So let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for each person that's here, every person that's watching online. Father, you know where we are. You know what we're walking through, what we're dealing with. Father, some of us at this topic, it's really close to home. And we're walking through some pain and some, some challenges right now, Father, that Honestly, we don't know what else to do, and we need you to show up. Father, for others of us, we, we may feel like, man, this topic doesn't really hit us or hit close to home, but God, I pray that for all of us, you would just open up our hearts, Father, open up our ears. Father, may we receive your word. God, may we hear clearly from you, and God, may we take the steps that you call us to take. It's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I grew up in a pretty normal American household. We were middle class. Uh, you know, two kids, a bunch of dogs, you know, cats every once in a while. Uh, my, uh, my dad um, later confessed to being an alcoholic. I never saw that. Uh, I mean, I would see him drink every night, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't what I thought of when I thought of alcoholism. Uh, there was a lot of pain in our family. We were really broken, uh, and that pain led me to doing some things. So in eighth grade, I started drinking. That summer, I started doing drugs, and things just got worse, uh, progressively worse over the years. And by 10th grade, uh, people began labeling me as an alcoholic and um, eventually I met Jesus. Somebody invited me to church. It's like I'm encouraging you guys to do uh, because that invitation changed my life. And I'm here today because of somebody inviting me. Um, I, I met Jesus and man, I was, I was healed. I was set free. Like God did so much amazing things in my life. Uh, but from that point on, I, I would use this phrase that I had an addictive personality. You ever heard that phrase before? Anybody ever uh, maybe said that about themselves or about somebody else? An addictive personality. I mean, when I got married, uh, I was playing video games till like three or four in the morning. My wife's like, what are you doing? Uh, you know, I would, um, uh, I would watch sports all the time, like all the time. And I couldn't even tell you, like if you were like, hey, Ernest, what, what was the best sporting 
you know, event that you watched back in like 07. I'm like, I have no clue. But man, I spent hours watching things that like I don't even matter today. Uh, you know, I, I had an addictive personality when it came to sodas. I would drink between 8 and 20 a day. Uh, and then I'm like, I got to give that up. It's probably not good for you. So then I started drinking sweet tea, pretty much the exact same equivalent. And then I just gave that up, actually. And so I just realized that, like, I have this addictive personality that where I can become addicted to things pretty quickly. But here's what I would say. I would say that based on our society and our culture, all of us can become addicted to things. Like all of us, our, our culture is leaning in a direction that is trying to make all of us have an addictive personality. I mean, like you look at any commercial, there's no commercial that you'll ever watch that you're, it's going to be like, hey, just do this, just buy this thing one time and you'll be good, right? They want to suck you in. Every commercial is like, buy this, it'll provide joy, it'll provide happiness, it'll provide peace, it'll provide whatever it is, and you got to keep buying that thing. They want you to become addicted to experiences, to products, to everything. I mean, I was thinking about myself and people in my life, people that I've counseled, and man, I could, I could make a list of a thousand items long that people have said they've been addicted to. Uh, I'm not going to go through a, a thousand item list, but I am going to list some things that people that, that either myself or other people would say, yeah, I've been addicted to that. And what I want you to do is I want you to just ask, am I currently addicted to that or am I trending in that direction? Because here's what I say about this topic. Most people that I come across would never say I'm addicted. Right? Because when you think of that, you think of like the big things like drugs, sex, you know, alcohol, that type of thing. But the reality is, I would say everybody in here, because of our culture and our society, can tend to lean toward addiction. So when I read this list, I just want you to ask yourself. And if you're like, man, I don't have any of these things, ask somebody that's close to you. Because they will clearly identify something in your life that you probably uh, maybe are addicted to or leaning toward. So obviously you have the big ones, drugs, sex alcohol. How about busyness? You ever seen somebody that's addicted to busyness where they've always got to be on the go? They've always got to be cleaning. They've always got to be doing something. They've always got to be working. They're just staying busy. That's an addiction. How about noise? One of the greatest addictions we have right now in our society is an addiction to noise. If you don't believe me, just watch people all over that are walking around with AirPods in, right? Just one, and then they're still like doing their normal activities. I'm like, I don't know how people do that. Like, I would, like, trip over the curb or something. But somehow, like, basically everybody that's younger than me, you know, like, walks around with one. And it's why? Because it's just noise. Like, we're becoming addicted. We need something in our lives, some type of noise in our lives. How about an addiction to coffee or soda? Can I get an amen from some of you coffee people? And be real honest with yourselves. Yeah. How about approval? You ever thought about an addiction of, of approval? Like, where you're longing for people to like you, to accept you? to want you to be a part of something, to tell you how great you are or how meaningful you are in their life? How about sleeping aids, shopping, work, the phone? I mean, this could be a massive addiction, right? I mean, I, I, I just gave this message last service, and I walked off the stage, and the first thing I did was pull this out. And I was like, what am I doing? Because it can become so addicting. Uh, how about technology? On average, they say that people will spend in their entire lives, people will spend five years and four months of their life on technology. Think about that for a moment. Five years of your life is going to technology. That's an addiction. And here's the problem with addictions. Sometimes we try to justify our addictions. We'll say something like, I'm not an alcoholic. I just, I just like to have one a night just to like calm me, just to help me go to sleep. Or I'm not, an, I'm not addicted to noise. I just like music playing all the time. I just like something, you know, being, being on all the time. I'm not addicted to work. It's just an extended season at work. That season just gets longer and longer. I'm not addicted to technology. You have to have it, Ernest. You can't not have technology. I'm not addicted to it. But no matter what, how much we justify it, addictions are destroying us. Like addictions destroy who we are. Addictions can literally kill you. We, we understand that. Addictions can destroy your marriage. Addictions will destroy your relationships. A recent uh, study found that 86% of smartphone users, which is most of us, say that, admit that they have conversations with people while on their phone. So like somebody is in front of you and you're looking at your phone while you're talking to them. And I bet if I were to say how many of us have done that, most of us would have to raise our hand. But like think about what that does to a relationship where like I'm supposed to be looking at you in the eye and I'm looking here, and I'm just, oh, yeah, 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 but I can, I, can, I can multitask. I can hear you and do this. 
It's ruining our friendships and our relationships. And all addiction will impact your mental health. All of it. One study found this, that teens who spend five or more hours on electronics per day, that might sound high, but it's not. And if you think about your entire day, think about the, the kids that you know, think about the teenagers that you know, teens that spend five or more hours a day on electronics are 71% more likely to exhibit suicide risk. 71%. Now, is that because of, of, uh, of social media? Probably. Is that because of you know, video game uses? Maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know all the reasons why, but I know that our technology, the, te- the addiction to technology is causing a massive, massive mental health epidemic in our country. So what do we do? And for some of us, we can say, yeah, man, I, Ernest, you're reading my mail. Like, I, I'm addicted. Like, I, I got it. I, I'm there. And I don't know what to do. It's impacting me. It's impacting my marriage. My wife tells me, get off social media. My husband tells me, stop playing that game or whatever it may be. But I just don't, I, I don't know how to, how to break free of it. Some of us, maybe for the first time, we're realizing maybe I have a tendency to lean toward an addiction. Like you never thought that busyness was that. You never thought maybe your work or maybe the noise or whatever was an addiction in your life. But you're thinking, uh, maybe now I am mentally dependent on that. That's what an addiction is. It's mental dependence on something. So today I want to I speak to those who are in it. And then I want to give suggestions for all of us. Because I think all of us deal with addiction in some way. I think all of us can lean toward an addiction if we don't already have it right now. And so I want to give some suggestions for us as well. We're going to look at a guy in scripture. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to uh, Judges chapter 16. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, no worries. It's going to be up on the screen. If you need a Bible, just as you walk into your car, the, the blue uh, connect tent, just stop there. Say, hey, I need a Bible. We'll get you one. We don't need your name, your money, anything like that. We just want to make sure every person has God's word. Let me set it up for you. So Judges 16, uh, we, we meet this guy named Samson. Uh, Samson is this great warrior. Uh, he's a judge of Israel, not a judge like you and I might think of judges uh, today. A judge back then was a leader of the country. So he was kind of like the president or the king. Now, Sam, Samson was um, probably one of the most complicated judges in Israel's uh, history. At that time, the Philistines and the Israelites hated each other. They were enemies. And then Samson, he goes off and he marries uh, a Philistine woman, which was a no-no. Like you were, he's breaking all cultural norms. He's breaking what, what God has commanded him to do. He's breaking all this stuff to marry this woman. Now, when he marries this Philistine woman, uh, he decides to take a trip right after the, the, the wedding, which, guys, probably is a never, good, never a good idea to get married and then take a trip or whatever. Uh, he does it. And when he does it, his father-in-law, for some reason, doesn't like him. So he gives his daughter to another man. Because in that culture, they had the power to do that. With the Philistines, the, 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 the father had the power to give his daughter to somebody else. So imagine, Samson marries this woman. He goes off on a trip. When he comes back, he realizes his, his wife is with somebody else because of his father-in-law. So, of course, he gets angry. He realizes this is a Philistine issue. He goes and burns a field that's owned by the Philistines. They get mad. They, they ask, okay, what, what's happened? But, oh, okay. They, they put the blame on Samson. So to get back at Samson... They kill his father-in-law, and they kill his wife. This, like, escalated really quick, right? Like, you've got this good guy, this judge that marries this woman, and now his wife is dead. And his father-in-law, which he probably is happy about, is dead. It escalated really quick. And that's where we pick up with a story. Judges chapter 16, verse 1. It says, one day Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. So stop there for a moment. So you've got Samson, he's this, he's this great warrior, right? And he's, uh, uh, he's judge over Israel, he's you know, a religious guy, and he gets married, he finds this woman, he gets married, she dies, so his next act is to go be with a prostitute. Now we know this isn't his last time with a prostitute, it might not have been his first time with a prostitute, we don't believe he was with one prior to getting married, but he's definitely been with multiple ones since she died. We, probably the most famous story is with Delilah uh, that, that we see, and she was a prostitute as well. So we'll see Samson with her later, and we'll see more of his story. What we're beginning to see is this pattern with Samson, that he has this mental dependence on women and sex. He sees this woman, this Philistine woman. He breaks all cultural norms. He does what he's not supposed to do, and he goes and marries her because he falls in love. I've got to have her. Then she dies, and he goes to a prostitute. I've got to have her. Then he goes to another prostitute. I've got to have her. He's got a sex addiction. He's got an addiction to these women, to sex. He's got this mental dependence on them. It's a pattern. 
Now, many times when we look at Samson's story, people don't recognize that about it. You just maybe have heard, you know, Samson and Delilah or something like that, but it's this mental dependence that he has on women and on sex that is creating this issue in his life. And we see two truths about addiction in Samson's life. Truth number one is this. Most addictions stem from pain. Most addictions stem from pain. And again, up until this point, up until Samson's wife is murdered, we don't see him with any prostitutes. In fact, we see this very zealous man for the Lord. He was what's called a Nazarite. A Nazarite was somebody that uh, couldn't cut their hair. He hadn't cut his hair since birth, so you can imagine how long that probably was. Uh, he couldn't drink, he couldn't do drugs, he uh, couldn't eat unclean meat. I mean, there was a lot of things that he couldn't do. Anything that, that uh, the Israelites would say was displeasing to God, he couldn't do those things. So he was like the religious of the religious. Like this was a really good guy. And now we see him with prostitutes. And not just one, but multiple. How does he get there? How does he go from being this highly religious man, this man who's trying to seek after God? I mean, he's anointed by God. Uh, later, we'll, we'll see in a story where he's this like super strong guy. I mean, he's got this like this you know, supernatural gift of power that God has given to him because he's obeyed God over the years. So this wasn't like some random guy. This wasn't like Ernest. This was like this guy was leading the entire nation. He was a super religious guy. How does he go to now seeking after prostitutes? Pain. The woman that he fell in love with, that he married, She's now dead. What do you do? I've never experienced that level of pain before. I can only imagine the downward spiral it would create. Because here's the reality about humanity. For all of us, pain usually sends people in a downward spiral. Like if you see people that you think, man, that's out of character for them. I didn't think they would ever do that. Well, if you find yourself in that place, more than likely it's because of pain. I've said this, I, I don't know, a bazillion times, that hurting people hurt people. And the first person that hurting people hurt is themselves. Like when you're hurting in life, you typically do things in your life that punish you. You'll punish others as well. You'll do things that will hurt others. But hurting people hurt people. I mean, I, my guess is that for those of us who can be honest enough to say that, man, I, I am dealing with some addiction or I am trending in that direction, my guess is most of us, there's some pain there. Maybe it stems from your childhood and something that is still there, still very present, some pain that's still very present. It's like an open wound. Maybe it stems from a, a marriage that uh, didn't meet the expectations or the hopes that you had. Maybe it's some loss that you've, you've encountered. Maybe the loss of a marriage or maybe the loss of an individual in your life and it's created some now unhealthy patterns, some mental dependence on some other things. Maybe somebody took advantage of you, or maybe life just keeps throwing haymakers at you. You're like, man, I can't ever take, get a break here. And it's just pain after pain after pain. I think it's why so many people, to be real honest, and I'm not trying to read your mail, I'm not trying to, to try to say it's you, but because I don't know. But I think it's why so many people are addicted to social media. Because like, it's way easier just to scroll and kind of forget about our own junk. Forget about how the expectations we have with our marriage aren't going the way that we want, how things at work aren't going the way that we want, how our finances are in, in a struggle, and we just, it's much easier just to like scroll through stuff and just kind of forget about what else is going on in our, our lives. Most addiction stems from pain. I'm not saying all of it, but most of it. Second truth about addictions that we see in Samson's life is that addictions don't have to define you. Addictions don't have to define you. Go back to Samson's story. It gets way worse before it ever gets better. And that's usually the way it is when you're addicted, right? When you have some type of addiction, usually life goes way worse before it ever gets, uh, gets better. Samson meets this woman named Delilah. Uh, Delilah is a Philistine as well. Uh, and so the Philistines come to her, the leaders come to her and say, hey, we need you to find out how Samson has his power. Like, how can we get to him eventually where he can't overcome us? And so Delilah's like, hey, Samson, come sleep with me. So they're, they're having sex. They're doing their thing. And so every day she's like, Samson, how do you have all your power? Just tell me the secret. And he's like, he's pulling jokes on her. He's lying to her and all that stuff. And she's getting frustrated. And she just keeps ber berating him every day. Every day she just keeps coming at him. Samson, tell me. Samson, tell me. And because his mental dependence is on women and on that sexual relationship, he succumbs to it. And so he says, well, 
my, the secret of my power lies in my hair. I've never cut it. It's just a representation of him being obedient to God. So he said, if you cut my hair, then I lose all my power. So what does she do? She cuts his hair. Philistines come in. They capture him. They gouge out his eyes, and they chain him up. And they chain him up basically to like, like he's at a zoo, like where people can just kind of come by and laugh at him, that type of thing. And Samson's last act at that point is to pray. And he says, God, will you please just one last time give me strength? He wants to destroy the, the leaders and all of that. He's chained up. He feels like if he can have the strength, he can collapse this, this situation they're on. It would kill him. It would also kill everybody else. He prays for that last, God, please just give me strength just one more time. And what I love about this story is that God doesn't say, ah, Samson, man, you're kind of too far gone, bro. Like your addictions have taken over your life. They've destroyed you. You've, you've kind of shut down the purpose that I had for you. You've cut short your life. I'm not going to answer that. He doesn't do that. He answers a prayer, and in that moment, he redeems his life. He redeems his story. And I love that because it's exactly what God does with us. Like, God wants to redeem you. Like, if you would say, man, I'm dealing with some, some addiction or I have before, God's not looking at you like, oh, you're too far gone. I'm so sorry. Like, your addiction to work or your addiction to approval or your addiction to your phone or whatever, it's just too far. I just, I can't take it anymore with you. When we come to him, God says, I'm offering you grace. Today, that's through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, God offers you and I grace. He offers us healing from our pain. He offers us freedom from sin and from addiction. He offers all of that to us. He doesn't say, you're too far gone. I'm so sorry. If you would have done those things, you'd be better off. He says, just come to me. And he offers us grace. It's still a very traumatic ending to Samson's life. The addiction cut short his life. And I would say, that God's purpose for him was not that ending. That God had other things that he wanted. And Samson cut it short with the addiction. It's very tragic, but it didn't define him. In fact, if you fast forward a bunch of books in the Bible, you go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is regarded as the hall of faith. Kind of like the hall of fame, but it's like these great people of the Old Testament. Great men and women that had just extraordinary faith. Like incredible faith. Like they were humans, right? Meaning that they were broken. They had their sin. They had their issues and all of that. But they had incredible faith that God's like, hey, I'm going to put a whole chapter in the Bible about these people because I want you to remember them and what they did. And so God gives us people like Noah, reminds us of people like Abraham, of Sarah, Joseph, Moses. And right in the middle of all of that is this guy named Samson. You look at his life and you're like, why would God put him in the hall of faith? He was addicted to sex. He was addicted to women. He cut his life short. He ends up killing himself. Why would God put him there? Your addictions don't define you. I would say because of Christ, he offers you and I hope. If you're walking through some type of addiction right now or you're leaning in that direction, it doesn't have to define who you are. It doesn't have to be the end of your story. There is hope. And if you want to overcome it, let me give you three steps you've got to take, that you have to take, okay? And here's what I'd say. If you, if you have an addiction right now or if you're leaning in that direction, that if you want to overcome an addiction or, or not go down that path, then you have to take these three steps. But there may be more steps that you need to take. Like some people might need to check themselves into a facility. That might be the best most helpful thing for you. Some of us might need professional counseling. Some of us might need medication. So there might be other things you need to add, but I'll say this, you cannot see the power of God come into your life and help you overcome an addiction without these three steps happening, okay? Step number one is you gotta humble yourself. You gotta humble yourself. You gotta admit that you have issues. You gotta admit that you have sin. All of us do. You just have to admit it. You have to say, yo, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm going through. I love this passage in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the testimony of our God. And God says, hey, if you confess your sins to me, I am faithful and just and I'll forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's huge. 
Like if you're going to memorize any scripture, memorize that one right there. But we have a part to play in God cleansing us and God cleansing the unrighteousness from us. And that part that we have to play is confession. It says, if you confess, if you admit that you have sin in your life, if you admit that this is where your life is heading, that you have this addiction, if you confess that to God, God is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us. Then look at this other passage, James chapter five. It says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So confession has to be a part of your story. First, confession to God. And when you confess to God, there's forgiveness of sins. And then confession to others. And it's not just like random others. It's godly people in your life. It says here that the prayer of a righteous person. It doesn't say like if you have, if you have an addiction to social media, go on Facebook and just tell everybody, guys, I have an addiction to social media. Like that may not help you. In fact, that's probably going to create a lot of questions for your friends. But you go to people who care about you, who are following the Lord, who care about your walk with God, and you tell them, hey, I have this addiction, or I'm leaning in this direction. Why? Because the righteous person, their prayer is powerful and effective. You have to humble yourself first. I mean, step one in any 12-step or 10-step or any program that people use is always confession. You have to admit it. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm dealing with. So humble yourself. Number two, you got to engage godly community. Engage godly community. That's why I love James chapter 5, verse 16, where it says, you know, confess your sins to one another and the prayer of a righteous person. Again, you're confessing to godly community. you got to get godly community around you. But the problem is when it comes to addiction and when you begin to see yourself going down a path that, that is not helpful, you don't lean in. You usually pull away. You usually withdraw. Like people will withdraw from church or groups or you know, friends or whatever it may be, and they begin to isolate. And the worst place you can be is in isolation. It's the worst place you can be. When you look at Samson's life, at the end of his life, where is he at? He's in bed with Delilah. Like that's where he finds himself. He's not at church. He's not in community group. He's not at Celebrate Recovery. He's not with his trusted advisors. He's in bed with a prostitute. He's isolated himself with his addiction, with his mental dependence on women and sex. Whenever you do that, whenever you pull away, here's what I can promise you. If you, if you start to see yourself pulling away or if you see other people pulling away, I'll guarantee you, unless they re-engage godly community, then in three months, six months, a year from now, they won't be in a better place. Like, I've never seen somebody isolate themselves and then come out of isolation and be like, oh, man, I'm so much better off. Like, it doesn't happen. Any professional counselor would tell you that isolation leads to greater mental health challenges. So, like, when you start to pull away, when you start to feel yourself going, ah, I just don't know if I want to go to church. I don't know if I want to be in this group. I don't know if I want to be on the serve team. Like, those are, that's just community. That's just people around you. It can be that engaging of godly community. When you start to pull away from that, watch out. Because you're probably going down a path that you don't want to go to. You're going to be able to isolate yourself, and it's not going to end well. The last thing to do, you've got to humble yourself. You've got to engage godly community. And lastly, you've got to seek accountability. Seek accountability. Let me say this as clear as I possibly can. I have never met anyone who has overcome addiction without accountability. I've had, I, I mean, I don't know how many thousands of hours of counseling with people that are walking through addictions. And I literally have never met one person who said, hey, I overcame addiction without accountability. Why? Because it doesn't happen. You have to have accountability. I love this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. That word encourage, it means to encourage, of course. It also means to strengthen, to instruct, and to teach. The Bible here actually is giving us a, a picture. The word, this word here is giving us a picture. And the, the word encourage, the picture literally means to have somebody come alongside of you and walk together. So the picture there is that if you want to encourage somebody, or if you want somebody to encourage you, you need to be next to them. 
If you want to instruct them and teach them and challenge them, you've got to be beside them. Because when I start to veer off course, I need you to say, no, 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 come back this way. I need your accountability. I need you to see where I'm at, know where we're going together, and then help me get there. That's accountability. So many people choose not to seek accountability. And I think it's actually because it goes back to point number one with humble yourself. Like to be accountable means you have to admit it. And not just to yourself or to God, but to somebody else. You have to say, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. And you know, today Ernest was talking about that stuff. And honestly, I think I have a phone addiction. Honestly, I think I have an addiction to social media or addiction to busyness. Or I don't think the season at work is just a season. I think... I think I'm addicted to it, or noise, or whatever it may be. You have to like, actually be humble enough to share that with somebody else. And if there's somebody that is godly, that godly community, they will help you. Accountability can be one-on-one. Accountability can be in a group. Accountability can be with a professional counselor. Accountability can be you downloading some software and putting other people on that software so they know what you're looking at, what you're not looking at. Accountability can come in all forms but you have to have it. You have to have it. I want to share a story with you from a couple in our church. And, you know, that's a, a tough topic. I mean, because, again, most people would say, I don't deal with this. But then when, like, you get into the weeds of it, you're like, okay, maybe, maybe I lean this direction. And so it's a tough topic to admit and to be able to share. And this couple, they were so brave to share their story and I think you'll, you'll see the different points that we just, I, it's funny because when we do these videos, I never tell them like, hey, here's my message, here's my points, if you could just hit on those for me, that'd be really nice. It's just like God just does it. He just shows himself faithful because scripture is so true in all of our lives. So I want you to, to watch this video. So my name's Mary. My name's John. I grew up in a Christian home, a not perfect home, And because of some of the dynamics that existed there, I struggled with feeling loved, feeling accepted. The way that manifest, even at a very young age, was wanting attention from boys, wanting attention from um, later from men. And so even at a young age, I would want to have two boyfriends at the same time just to be able to get enough attention, enough sense that I am worthy, that I'm cared about. That made it difficult for me to commit to a relationship. And I tended to be a serial monogamist. I would have a relationship for three months and then I would get bored and I would break up. When John fell so strongly in love with me, I didn't feel very good at loving another person. Things went along okay in our marriage, but I definitely found myself seeking attention outside of our marriage, even early on. But it took about 13 years before I really started acting out on that. I was candid with John about what I was feeling um, and even asking for an open marriage. I did uh, act out with some other men. I mean, there was a period of time where I wanted out of our marriage and at the same time wanted to stay in our marriage and was so frustrated by this double life that I was living that I even thought about how nice it would be to die. Eventually, through some therapeutic processes, was diagnosed with a love and relationship addiction. When I was in early elementary school, a neighborhood boy uh, sexually abused me a number of times. Over time, as I got a little older, uh, I I just kept internalizing that. I I, I tried to talk with my parents briefly about that, and per usual, in in my family dynamic, we just didn't talk about things like that. So I was kind of alone. That shame and confusion, this complexity, that led to obsessions, lusts, pornography. Even despite giving my life to Jesus, I was harboring all of that on the inside and feared talking about that with anybody. It really affected our intimacy and our relationship because it sent a message, inadvertently, but it sent a message to Mary that she wasn't cherished, that she was inadequate or not, couldn't, be, couldn't be good enough. We were 
So by happenstance, we got involved in a, in a marriage retreat weekend that counselor recognized in both of us. He recognized signs of abuse in me and recognized the love addiction in Mary. And through that, he gave me enough courage to, to share with Mary and uh, my, my experience, my, my history, not just with Mary, but with other people too, other, other trusted people, that to be able to share embarrassing, shameful, hurtful things in our past and in our present with other people who are accepting, non-judgmental, just embracing and understanding is where real healing has happened for me. It was just the power of God to redeem what I thought was scary and, and shameful and fearful into something, something beautiful. You are not alone in whatever it is that you are experiencing. Sin is addictive and it can be very, very hard to um, confess that without a place that is safe to do so. God, in His infinite power and wisdom, was able to transform the situation and help us find each other. And I found God whispering to me, can I be sufficient for you? Is my grace sufficient for you? And if the minute I say yes, yes, you're enough, He's enough. And He blessed me with the love of my life. I had, I, it's just so amazing. It's such a gift. It's like a miracle. I'm so grateful. So Mary said uh, two things there. She said, one, sin is addictive, and it is. Sin is like sugar. I mean, like, sugar is put into everything because of how addictive it is. Sin is that very thing. It's so addictive. And then she said, it's really hard to confess it without a safe place. And my prayer is that this would be a safe place for you. That our church our community groups, all the things that we offer and that we have would be a safe place for you to say, this is where I'm at. Because without that, there's no healing. There's no freedom. One of the things that they showed in the video, but John and Mary didn't say there, is that um, they're a part of this group called Celebrate Recovery. They're one of the ones that helped start it. <clears throat> you can watch how they walk through the process, right, where they humbled themselves, they admitted what was going on, they sought after a godly community, they went to a marriage retreat, they've gotten counseling and all of that, and they sought accountability. Now they want to be a part of that for others. So like they're both in counseling, like they do counseling for other people, like that's the field, the professional field that they chose, I think part of, part of their story. Uh, but then they also came to me like six months ago and they said, hey Ernest, we wanna start Celebrate Recovery here. And some of you know about Celebrate Recovery. I've talked about it before. It's, it's every Monday night at our ministry center, every single Monday night. We don't take a break because addiction doesn't take a break. It's an opportunity for people, no matter what the struggle is, no matter what the hangup is, it's not just alcohol and drugs and the, those big things that we think about. I mean, it's, it's anything that's holding you up from what God wants in your life. And so they've started that to help other people find freedom and healing in their own life. So what step do you need to take? Is it that first step in being humble and saying, man, I do deal with this. And being honest with somebody, confessing it to God, confessing it to somebody else. Maybe you can see that you're starting to trend in that direction. You're starting to move toward an addiction. You're like, I don't want to get there. I don't want technology to rule my life. I don't want busyness to, I don't want these things. But you're starting to lean that direction. Maybe for you, it's engaging that godly community. It's getting in a group. It's showing up to celebrate recovery. You don't, you, don't need to have to, you don't even have to register. Just show up. It's a safe place. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's a community group. Maybe it's something else here at our church. And then seek accountability. Once you have that community around you, it's asking somebody, hey, will you hold me accountable to this? I don't want to deal with porn anymore. I don't work, want work to be, you know, the thing that drives everything in my life. I don't want my phone to control me. I don't, whatever it may be. And again, I would say this topic hits all of us, every single one of us, if we're honest enough. You got to get accountability. What step do you need to take today? Let's pray. Father, we come before you and 
God, we just thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for Samson's life. And God, as messed up as it, as it was in some ways, God, it's a reflection of my life too. In so many of our lives, Father, we may not have the same addiction as him, but that mental dependence on something other than you, God, that our world continually throws at us, that we buy into. God, I pray that you would set us free. You would bring healing, God, where there's pain, as we know that many addictions start with pain. So God, for those of us who are walking through pain right now, Father, I pray for healing, healing from that loss we've experienced, healing from that broken relationship, healing just from all the things maybe that have been happening or our past, or whatever it may be, God, bring healing in our, into our lives, Father. Jesus, we look to you for that. We come to you for that. Your word says that you bore the stripes on the cross for our healing. It wasn't just spiritual healing, but it's all healing. God. So God, we ask for that now. And then God, if we can be honest and admit, Father, where we are, for some of us, we have an addiction. We know how it's impacting us. For others of us, we're leaning in that direction. And God, I pray that through our humility, through our seeking of godly community, and through our seeking accountability, Father, that you would bring healing into our lives. That as your word says, if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If we confess our sins to others, that, Father, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, and God, we will be healed. So in Jesus' name, we ask for that. God, bring healing into our lives. We pursue after you and come after you. May our complete dependence, God, be on you. In Jesus' name, amen.